Namaste, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Niha, Buenos Dias, Ezeche, Akwab, Velkumin, what up though? This is the recorded recitation of weekly holy scriptures, Tobadigu uh, Gadao, portion numero once by Gash. That includes uh, within the Torah by Gash, which is Bereshit 44, 18 a 47, 27. Within the Bhagavad Gita, that is Visvaru Par Pardarshana Yogehe, numero once, within the Bhagavad Gita. Within the Digha Nikaya, that is, it is Kasapa Sihanada Sutta, numero ocho. Within the Gospels, it is Matthew chapter 21 a 22. Within the Quran, it is Surah Hud, numero once. And within the Tao Te Ching, it is chapters 61 a 66. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allah wa abha. Deus nos de ki es in chelis son of kita no metum bahig gusano. Dao ke dao ke hunda. Ja. Baruch ata Adonai elahino melacha alam hamutsi lachem in haaretz. Kiri eleison. Sebo masu sabe jagatehi. Sabe sata bavadu suki tata. Fagabia. Ubuntu. Shabon. Fekako. Aqua ba upinan amani. Umjaga. Shishet, como se mira, domo aragato, pelo ma yelo wokantoko, tok o doka shingu, God, we thank you for all of Jibasas, Golden of the Gods. Ata jami yatas mami, aho, om shanti shanti shanti, amen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah wa abha. Deus nos de ki es in chelis. Sanko fakito no mitu um. Bahig gusana. Dao ke dao ke hong dao. Ja. Baruch chata arunai elahino melecha alam. Ashe katsama ba mitzvah pa pizivam le sopa bravai tora. Kiri eleison. Sivu masu sabi gatehi. Sabe sata bavantu suki tata. Fagabia. Umbuntu. Shabon. Fekako. Akwa ba upendo na amani. Umjaka. Shishet, como se mira, domo aragato, pelo ma yelo wokan toko, tok o doko shingur, God, we thank you for all the blessings, go me the God. Ata jami yata fanami, aho, om shanti shanti shanti, amen. Gash Bereshit 44, 18 a 47, 27. Then Yehuda approached him and said, Please, my master, let now your servant speak something into my master's ears, and let not your wrath be kindled against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh. My master asked his servant, saying, Have you a far or a brother? And we said to my master, We have an old far and a young child of his old age, and his brother is dead. And he is left alone of his moor, and his far loves him. And you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, and I will set my eyes upon him. And we said to my master, The boy cannot leave his far, for if he leaves his far, he will die. And you said to your servants, If your youngest brother does not come down with you, you will not see my face again. And it came to pass when we went up to your servant, my far, and we told him the words of my master, that our far said, Go back, buy us a little food. But we said, We cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go down. For we cannot see the man's face if our youngest brother is not with us. And your servant, my far, said to us, You know that my wife bore, two, bore me two children. The one went away from me, and I said, He has surely been torn to pieces, to segments, and I have not seen him since. Now if you take this one too away from me, and misfortune befalls him, you will bring down my hoary head in misery to the grave." And now when I come to your servant, my far, and the boy is not with us, since his soul is attached to his, the boy's soul, 
it will come to pass when he sees that the boy is gone, he will die. And your servants will have brought down the hoary head of your servant, Arfar, in grief to the grave. For your servant assumed responsibility for the boy from my far, saying, If I do not bring him to you, I will have sinned against my far forever. So now please let your servant stay instead of the boy as a slave to my master, and may the boy go up with his brothers. For how long will I go up to my far if the boy is not with me? Let me not see the misery that will befall my far, that will befall my far. Now Yosef could not bear all those standing behind him. And he called out, Take everyone away from me. So no one stood with him when Yosef made himself known to his brothers. And he wept out loud. So the Egyptians heard, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Yosef said to his brothers, I am Yosef. Is my far still alive? But his brothers could not answer him because they were startled by his presence. Then Yosef said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they drew closer. And he said, I am your brother Yosef, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be sad, and let it not trouble you that you sold me here, for it was to preserve life that God sent me before you. For already two years of famine have passed in the midst of the land, and for another five years there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to make for you a remnant in the land, and to preserve it for you for a great deliverance. And now you did not send me here, but God and Adonai made me afar to Pharaoh, a master over all his household, and a ruler over the entire land of Egypt. Hasten and go up to my far, and say to him, So said your son Yosef, God has made me a master over all the Egyptians. Come down to me, do not tarry. And you shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall not, and you shall bear near to me, and you and your children and your grandchildren and your flocks and your cattle and all that is yours. And I will sustain you there, for there are still five years of famine, lest you become impoverished, you and your household and all that is yours. And behold, your eyes see, as well as the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth speaking to you, and you shall tell my far of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you shall hasten and bring my far down here. And he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and afterwards his brothers spoke with him. And the voice was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Yosef's brothers have come, and it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Yosef, Tell your brothers, Do this, do this, load up your beasts and go, enter the land of Canaan, and take your far and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you will eat the fat of the land. And you, Yosef, have been made have been commanded to tell them, Do this, take yourselves wagons from the land of Egypt for your young children and for your wives, and you shall carry your far and come. And let your eye not be concerned about your utensils, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the sons of Israel did so, and Yosef gave them wagons by Pharaoh's orders, and he gave them provisions for the way. He gave them all, to each one, several changes of clothes, and to Benjamin he gave three hundred parts of silver and five changes of clothes. And to his far he sent the following, ten he-donkeys carrying the best of Egypt, and ten she-donkeys carrying grain, bread, and other food for as far for the way. And he sent off his brothers, and they went, and he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went up from Egypt, and they came to the land of Canaan, to their far Yaakov. And they told him, saying, Yosef is still alive. And they told him that he ruled over the entire land of Egypt, and his heart changed, for he did not believe them. And they told him of all, all, they told him all of Yosef's words that he had said to them. And he saw the wagons that Yosef had sent to carry him, and the spirit of their far Yaakov was revived. And Israel said, Enough, my son Yosef is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. And Israel and all that was his set out and came to Beersheba. And he slaughtered sacrifices to the God of his far Yitzach. And God said to Israel in visions of the night. And Adonai said, Yaakov, Yaakov. And he said, Here I am. And Adonai said, I am God, the God of your far. Do not be afraid of going down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up, and Yosef will place his hands on your eyes. And Yaakov arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their far Yaakov and their young children and their wives and the wagons Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their livestock and their possessions that they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and they came to Egypt, Yaakov and all his descendants with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. And these are the names of the children of Israel who were coming to Egypt. Yaakov and his sons Yaakov's firstborn was Reuben. And the sons of Reuben were Hanauch and Palu, Hezron and Carmi. And the sons of Shimon were Yemuel, Yamin, 
Ohad, Yachin, and Zohar, and Saul the son of the Canaanite, Canaanitess. And the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kehat, and Merari. And the sons of Yehuda were Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. Now Er and Onan had died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. And the sons of Issachar were Tola, Puva, Yob, and Shimon. And the sons of Zebulun were Sered, Elon, and Yalil. These are the sons of Leah that she bore to Yaakov in Padan Aram, and Dina his daughter. All the souls of the sons and daughters were thirty-three. And the sons of Gad were Ziphion, Hagi, Shuni, and Ezbon, Eri, Arodi, and Ereli. And the sons of Asher were Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, and Bria, and Serah their sister. And the sons of Bria were Heber and Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Leah, and she bore these to Yaakov, sixteen souls. The sons of Rachel, Yaakov's wife, were Yosef and Benjamin. And to Yosef were born in the land of Egypt, whom Asanat, the daughter of Potipharah, the governor of On, bore to him Manasseh and Ephraim. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, and Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. These, the sons of Rachel, who were born to Yaakov, all the souls were fourteen. And the sons of Dan, Hushim, and the sons of Naphtali were Yazil, Guni, Yazer, and Shelem. These are the sons of Bilah, whom Lavan had given to his daughter Rachel, and she bore these to Yaakov. All the souls were seven. All the souls coming to Egypt with Yaakov, those descended from him, excluding the wives of Yaakov's sons, all the souls were sixty-six. And Yosef's sons who were born to him in Egypt, two souls, all the souls of the house of Yaakov, who came to Egypt, were seventy. He sent Yehuda ahead of him to Yosef to direct him to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. And Yosef harnessed his chariot, and he went up to meet Israel his far to Goshen. And he appeared to him, and he fell on his neck, and he wept on his neck for a long time. And Israel said to Yosef, I will die this time, since I have seen your face, that you are still alive. Yosef said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh, and I will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, for they were always owners of livestock, and their flocks and their cattle, and all they have, they have brought. And if it comes to pass that Pharaoh calls you and asks, What is your occupation? You shall say, Your servants have been owners of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our ancestors so that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, because all the shepherds are abhorrent to the Egyptians. Yosef came and told Pharaoh, and he said, My far and my brothers and their flocks and their cattle and all that is theirs have come from the land of Canaan, and behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And from amongst his brothers he took five men, and he presented them before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our forefathers. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for your servants' flocks have no pasture, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spoke to Yosef, saying, Your far and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is opened before you. In the best of the land, settle your far and your brothers. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen, and if you know that there, there are capable men amongst them, make them livestock officers over what is mine. So Yosef brought his far Yaakov and stood him before Pharaoh, and Yaakov greeted Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Yaakov, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Yaakov said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojournings are one hundred thirty years. The days of the years of my life have been few and miserable, and they have not reached the days of the years of the lives of my forefathers in the days of their sojournings. So Yaakov blessed Pharaoh and left Pharaoh's presence. Yosef settled his far and his brothers, and he, came, and he gave them property in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had mandated. And Yosef sustained his far and his brothers and his far's entire household with bread according to the young children. Now there was no food in the entire land, for the famine had grown exceedingly severe, and the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan were exhausted because of the famine. And Yosef collected all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan with the grain that they were burying, and Yosef brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Now the money was depleted from the land of Egypt and from the land of Canaan, and all the Egyptians came to Yosef, saying, Give us food. Why should we die in your presence, since the money has been used up? And Yosef said, Give me your livestock, and I will give you food in return for your livestock, if the money has been utilized up. So they brought their livestock to Yosef, and Yosef gave them food in return for the horses, and for the livestock and flocks, and in cattle and in donkeys. And he provided them with food in return for all their, flock, all their livestock in that year. That year ended, and they came to him in the second year, and they said to him, 
we will not hide from our from my master for in so much as the money and the property in animals have been forfeited forfeited to my master nothing remains before my master except our bodies and our farm and our tilling land why should we die before our your eyes both we and our tilling land buy us and our tilling land for food so that we and our tilling land will be slaves to pharaoh and give us seed so that we live and not die and the soil will not lie fallow so Yosef bought all the tilling land of the Egyptians for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold each one his field, for the famine had become too strong for them, and the land became Pharaoh's. <clears throat> and he transferred the populace to the cities from one end of the boundary of Egypt to its other end. Only the tilling land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they ate their allotment that Pharaoh had given them. Therefore they did not sell their tilling land. Yosef said to the people, Behold, I have bought you and your tilling land today for Pharaoh. Behold, you have seed, so sow the soil. And it shall be concerning the crops that you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and the remaining four parts shall be yours, for seed, for your fields, for your food, for those in your houses, and for your young children to eat. They replied, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in my master's eyes, and we will be slaves to Pharaoh. So Yosef made it a statute to this day concerning the, the tilling land of Egypt for the, for the one-fifth. Only the tilling land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen, and they acquired property in it, and they were prolific and multiplied greatly. Bhagavad Gita Visvaru Padar Sana Yogehe. Arjuna said, Out of compassion for me, you have spoken words of ultimate profundity concerning the self, and they have dispelled my delusion. I have learned from you at length, O lotus-eyed Krishna, of the origin and dissolution of beings and also of your inexhaustible greatness. As you have declared yourself to be, O Supreme Lord, even so it is. Yet do I desire to see your Isvara form, O Supreme Purusha. If, O Lord, you think me able to behold it, then, O Master of Yogis, reveal to me your immutable self. Sri Krishna said, Behold my forms, O Partha, by the hundreds and the thousands, manifold and divine, various in shape and hue. Behold the Adityas, and the Vasus, and the Rudras, and the Twin Aswins, and the Maruts. Behold, O Bharata, many wonders that no one has ever seen before. Behold here today, Gidda Kesa, the whole universe of the moving and the unmoving, and whatever else you desire to see, all concentrated in my body. But with these eyes of yours you cannot see me. I give you a divine eye. Behold now my sovereign yoga power. Sanjaya said, Having spoken thus, O King Hari, the great lord of yoga, revealed to Arjuna Brahman's supreme form as Isvara. With many faces and eyes, presenting many wondrous sights, bedecked with many celestial ornaments, armed with many divine uplifted weapons, wearing celestial garlands and vestments, anointed with divine perfumes, all wonderful, resplendent, boundless, and with faces on all sides. <clears throat> if the radiance of a thousand soleils were to burst forth at once in the sky, that would be like the splendor of the Mighty One. There in the person of the God of Angels, Arjuna beheld the whole universe, with its manifold divisions all gathered together in one. Then overcome with wonder, his hair standing on end, Arjuna bowed his head to the Lord, joined his palms in salutation, and thus addressed Brahman. 
Arjuna said, In thy body, O Lord, I behold all the angels and all the diverse hosts of beings, the master Brahma seated on the lotus and all the rishis and the celestial serpents. <clears throat> I behold thee with myriads of arms and bellies, with myriad of faces and eyes, and behold, I behold thee infinite in form on every side. But I see not thy end, nor thy middle, nor thy beginning, O Lord of the universe, O universal form. I behold thee on all sides, glowing like a mass of radiance, with thy diadem and mace and discus blazing everywhere like burning fire and the burning soleil, hard to look at and passing all measure. Thou art the imperishable, the supreme being to be realized. Thou art the supreme support of the universe. Thou art the undying guardian of the eternal Dharma. Thou art, in my belief, the primal being. I behold thee as one without beginning, middle, or end, with infinite arms and immeasurable strength, with the soleil of the moon as thine eyes, with thy face shining like a blazing fire, and burning with thy radiance the whole universe. By thee alone are filled all the space between heaven and earth, and all the quarters of the sky. O mighty one, the three worlds behold thy marvelous and appalling form, and tremble with fear. <clears throat> Into thee enter these hosts of angels, and some in... And some in fear extol thee with folded hands, and bands of rishis and siddhas exclaim, May there be peace, and praise thee with splendid hymns. The Rudras, Adityas, Vasus, and Saya, the Viswas, Aswins, Maruts, and Ushmapas, and the hosts of the Gandharvas, Yakshas, Asuras, and Siddhas, all behold thee, and are amazed, beholding thy great form, O mighty Master, with myriads of mouths and eyes, with myriads of arms and thighs and feet, with myriads of bellies, and with myriads of terrible tusks, the worlds are affrighted, and so am I. When I look upon thy blazing form reaching to the skies and shining in many colors, when I see thee with the mouths opened, thy mouths open wide, and thy great eyes glowing bright, my inmost soul trembles in fear, and I find neither courage nor peace, O Vishnu. When I behold thy mouths striking terror with their tusks, like time's all-consuming fire, I am disoriented and find no peace. Be gracious, O Lord of the angels, O abode of the universe. All the sons of Dhritarashtra, together with the hosts of monarchs and Bhishma, Drona, and Karna, and the warrior ch warriors' chiefs of our side as well, enter precipitately. Thy tusks and terrible mouths frightful to behold. Some are seen caught between thy teeth, their heads crushed to powder. As the many torrents of the rivers rush towards the ocean, so do the heroes of the living world rush into the, thy fiercely flaming mouths. As moths rush swiftly into a blazing fire to perish there, even so do these creatures swiftly rush into thy mouths to their destruction. Thou lickest thy lips, devouring all the worlds on every side with thy flaming mouths. Thy fiery rays fill the whole universe with their radiance and scorch it, O Vishnu. Tell me who thou art that wearest this frightful form. Salutations to thee, O God Supreme. Have mercy. I desire to know thee who art the primal one, for I do not understand thy purpose. <clears throat> Sri Krishna said, I am mighty, world-destroying world time, now engaged here in slaying these men. Even without you, all these warriors standing arrayed in the opposing army shall not live. Therefore stand up and win glory. Conquer your enemies and enjoy an opulent kingdom. By me and none other have they already been slain. By be an instrument only, Arjuna. O oh, Arjuna, kill Drona and Bhishma and Jayadra, Jayadratha and Karna and the other great warriors as well who have already been killed by me. Do, be not distressed by fear. Fight and you shall conquer your foes in the battle. Sanjaya said, Having heard these words of Krishna, Arjuna trembled, folding his hands in adoration and bowed down. Overwhelmed with fear, he saluted Krishna and then addressed Brahman again with faltering voice. Arjuna said, It is right, O Hishikesa, that the world rejoices and delights in glorifying thee. The Rakashas flee on all sides in terror, and the hosts of Siddhas all bow to thee in adoration. And why should they not bow down to thee, O mighty being, greater than all, since thou art the primal cause even of Brahman? O infinite Lord, O infinite one, Lord of angels, abode of the universe, thou art the imperishable being and non being, and that which is the supreme. Thou art the first of angels, the ancient soul. Thou art the supreme resting place of the universe. Thou art the knower and that which is to be known and the ultimate goal. 
any by thee is the world pervaded and by thee is the world pervaded pervaded O thou of infinite form thou art wind and death and fire and moon and the lord of water thou art prajapati and the great grandsire salutations salutations to thee a thousand times and again and, and yet again salutations salutations to thee salutations to thee before salutations to thee behind salutations to thee on every side O all Infinite in might and immeasurable in strength, thou pervadest all, and therefore thou art all. Whatever I have rashly said from inadvertence or love, addressing thee as O Krishna or O Yadava or O friend, regarding thee merely as a friend, unaware of thy greatness, and in whatever other ways I may have shown disrespect to thee, whilst playing or resting, whilst sitting or eating, whilst alone, O eternal Lord, or in the presence of others, all that I implore thee, O measurable, to forgive. Thou art the creator of the world. All, of all that move and all that do not move. Thou art the object of his worship, its most venerable teacher. There is no equal to thee. How then in the, in the three worlds could there be another superior to thee, O thou of incomparable might? Therefore I bow down and prostrate my body before thee, the adorable Lord, and seek thy grace. Bear with me, O Lord, as a far with a son, as a friend with a friend, as a lover with his beloved. I rejoice that I have seen what was never seen before, but my mind is also troubled with fear. Show me that other form of thine. Be gracious, O Lord of angels, abode of the universe. I would see thee as before, with thy crown and thy mace and the discus in thy hand. Assume again thy forearm shaped, O thou of the thousand arms and endless shapes. Sri Krishna said, By my grace, through my own yoga power, O Arjuna, I have shown you this supreme form, resplendent, universal, infinite, and primeval, which none but you has ever seen. Neither by the study of the Vedas and sacrifices, nor by gifts, nor by rituals, nor by severe penances, is this form of mine to be seen in the world of men by anyone but you, O chief of the Kurus. Be not afraid, be not bewildered on seeing this ter terrific form of mine. From f free from fear and glad of heart, behold again my other form. Sanjaya said, Having thus addressed Arjuna, Vasudeva revealed to him Sri Krishna's own form. The great one assumed a graceful shape again and comforted the terrified Pandava. Arjuna said, Looking at this gentle form of yours, O Janardana, I now feel composed in mind. I am myself again. Sri Krishna said, It is very hard to see this form of mine which you have seen. Even the angels are ever eager to see this form. Neither by the Vedas, nor by penances, nor by almsgiving, nor yet by sacrifice am I to be seen in the form in which you have nor beheld, nor beheld me. But by devotion to me alone may I be known in this form, O Arjuna, realized truly and entered into, O dreaded prince. He who does my work and looks on me as the supreme goal, who is devoted to me, who is without attachment and without hatred for any creature, he comes to me, O Pandava. Diganakaya, Kasapa Sehanada Sutta, Numero Ocho. Thus have I heard. The Blessed One was once dwelling at Uganya, in the Kanakatala Deer Park. Now Kasapa, naked ascetic, came to where the Exalted One was, and exchanged with him the greetings and compliments of civility and courtesy, and stood respectfully aside. And so standing, he said to the Exalted One, I have heard it said, Gautama, thus, the Samana Gautama disparages all penance. Verily, he reviles and finds fault with every ascetic, every, with every one who lives a hard life. Now those, O Gautama, who said this, were they therein repeating Gautama's words and not reporting him falsely? Are they announcing as a minor tenant of his a matter truly following from his dharma, his, his system? Is there nothing in his opinion, in this opinion of his, so put forward as wrapped up with his system, or as a corollary from it, that could meet with objection? For we would fain bring no false accusation against the Venerable Gautama. No, Kasapa, those who said so were not following my words. On the contrary, they were repeating me falsely, and at variance with the fact. Herein, O Kasapa, I am wont to be aware, with, bright, with vision bright and purified, seeing beyond what men can see, how some men given to asceticism, living a hard life, are reborn on the dissolution of the body after death into some unhappy fallen state of misery and woe, whilst others, living just so, are reborn into some happy state or into, some, into a heavenly world. Now some men given to asceticism, but living a life less hard, are equally reborn on the dissolution of the body after death into some unhappy fallen state of misery and woe, whilst others living just so are reborn into some happy state or into a heavenly world. 
How then could I, O Kasapa, who am thus aware, as they truly are, of the states whence men have come, and whither they will go, as they pass away from one form of existence, and take shape in another? How could I disparage all penance, or bluntly revile and find fault with every ascetic, with every one who lives a life that is hard? Now there are, there are O Kasapa, certain recluses and Brahmins who are clever, subtle, experienced in controversy, hair splitters, who go about, one would think, breaking into parts by their wisdom the speculations of their adversaries. And as between them and me there is, as, as to some points, agreement, and as to some points not. As to some of those they of some of those things they approve, we also approve thereof. As to some of those things they disapprove, we also disapprove thereof. As to some of the things they approve, we disapprove thereof. As to some of the things they disapprove, we approve thereof. And some things we approve of, so do they. And some things we disapprove of, so do they. And some things we approve, they do not. And some things we disapprove of, they approve of. <clears throat> and I went to them and said, As for those things, my friends, on which we do not agree, let us leave them alone. As to those things on which we agree, let the wise put questions about them, ask for reasons as to them, talk them over, with or to their teacher, with or to their fellow disciples, saying, Those conditions of heart, sirs, which are evil or accounted as evil amongst you, which are blameworthy and are, or accounted as such amongst you, which are insufficient for the attainment of Arahatship or accounted as much amongst you, depraved or accounted as much amongst you, who is it who conducts himself as one who has more further absolutely put them away from him? the Samana Gotama, or the other venerable ones, the teachers of schools. Then it may well be, O Kasapa, that the wise, so putting questions one to the other, asking for reasons, talking the matter over, should say, the Samana Gotama conducts himself as one who has absolutely put those conditions away from him, whereas the venerable ones, the others, the other teachers of schools, have done so only partially. Thus is it, O Kasapa, that the wise, so putting questions one to the other, asking for reasons, talking the matter over, would for the most part speak in honor of us therein. And again, O Kosapa, let the wise put questions one to another, ask for reasons, talk the matter over, with or with, to their teacher, with or to their fellow disciples, saying, Those conditions of heart, sirs, which are benevolent or accounted as such amongst you, which are blameless or accounted as much amongst you, which suffice to lead a man to our hardship or are accounted as sufficient amongst you, which are pure or accounted as such amongst you, who is it who conducts himself as one who has further completely taken them upon him, the Samana Gotama or the other venerable ones, the teachers of schools? Then it may well be, O Kasapa, that the wise, so putting questions one to the other, asking for reasons, talking the matter over, should say, The Samana Gotama conducts himself as one who has completely taken these conditions upon him, whereas the venerable ones, the others, the other teachers of schools, have done so only partially. Thus it is, O Kasapa, that the wise, so putting questions one to the other, asking for reasons, talking the matter over, would for the most part speak in honor of us therein. And further, also, O Kasapa, the wise would for the most part acknowledge that the body of my disciples were further addicted to that which is generally acknowledged to be benevolent, refrain themselves further completely from that which is generally acknowledged to be evil, that the venerable ones, the disciples of others, than the venerable ones, the disciples of other teachers. Now there is, O Kasapa, a way, there is a method which if a man follow, he will of himself both see and know that the Samana Gotama is one who speaks in due season, speaks that which is, that which redounds to advantage, that which is the norm, the Dharma, that which is the law of self-restraint, the Vinaya. And what Kasapa is that way, what that method, which if a man follow, he will of himself know that and see that the barely, see that, verily it is the noble eightfold path, that is to say, Right views, right aspirations, right speech, right action, right mode of livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right rapture. This kasapa is that way, this that method, which if a man follow, he will of himself both know and see that. The Samana Gotam is one who speaks in due season, speaks that which is, that which redounds to profit, that's we, that which redounds to benefit, that which is the Dharma, that which is the law of self-restraint. And when he had spoken thus, kasapa, the naked ascetic, said to the exalted one, and so also, Gotama, are the following ascetic practices accounted in the opinion of some Samanas and Brahmanas as Samanaship and Brahmanaship. He goes naked. He is of loose habits, performing his bodily functions and eating food in a standing posture, not crouching down or sitting down as well-bred people do. He licks his hands clean after eating instead of washing them as others do. When on his round for, rounds for alms, if politely requested to step nearer or to wait a moment in order that food may be put in his, into his bowl, he passes stolidly on, lest he should incur the guilt of following another person's work. He refuses to accept food brought to him before he has started on his daily round for alms. 
He refuses to accept food that, if told that it has been prepared especially for him. He refuses to accept any invitation to call on his rounds at any particular house or to pass along any particular street or to go to any particular place. He will not accept food taken direct from the mouth or the pot or pans in which it is cooked lest those vessels should be struck or scraped on his account with the spoon. He will not accept food placed within the threshold lest it should have been placed there especially for him. He will not accept food placed amongst the sticks lest it should have been placed there especially for him. He will not accept food placed amongst the pestles lest it should have been placed there especially for him. When two persons are eating together, he will not accept food when taken from what they are eating if offered to him by only one of the two. He will not accept food from a woman with child lest the child should suffer want. He will not accept food from a woman giving suck lest the milk should grow less. He will not accept food from a woman in intercourse with a man lest their intercourse be hindered. He will not accept food collected by the faithful in time of drought. He will not accept food where a dog is standing by lest the dog should lose a meal. He will not accept food where flies are swarming round lest the flies should suffer. He will not accept fish, meat, nor meat, nor strong drink, nor intoxicants, nor gruel. He is a one house a one houser turning back from his round as soon as he has received an alms at any one house, a one mouth mouthful man. He is a two houser, a two mouthful man, or he is a seven houser, a seven ho seven mouthful man. He keeps himself going on only one alms, or on only two, or so on up to only seven. He takes food only once a day, or once every two days, or so up on up to once every seven days. Thus does he dwell addicted to the practice of taking taking food according to rule at inter regular intervals up to even half a month. And so also, Gautama, are the following ascetic practices accounted in the opinion of some samanas and brahmanas as samanaship and brahmanaship. He feeds on pot herbs, on wild rice, on navara seeds, on leather parings, on the water plant called hatha, on the fine powder which adheres to the grains of rice beneath the husk, on the discarded scum of boiling rice, on the flour of oil seeds, on grasses, on cow dung, on fruits and roots from the woods, on fruits that have fallen of themselves. And so also, Gautama, are the following ascetic practices accounted in the opinion of some samanas and brahmanas as samanaship and brahmanaship. He wears coarse hemp and cloth. He wears coarse cloth of interwoven hemp and other materials. He wears cloths taken from corpses and thrown away. He wears clothing made of rags picked up from a dust heap. He wears clothing made of the bark of the tirataka tree. He wears the natural hide of a black antelope. He wears a dress made of a network of strips of a black, black antelope's hide. He wears a dress made of kusha grass fiber. He wears a garment of bark. He wears a garment made of small slips or slabs of wood shingle segments together. He wears a garment of bl a blanket of human hair. He wears as a garment a blanket made of horses' tails. He wears as a garment a blanket made of the feathers of owls. He is a plucker out of hair and beard, addicted to the practice of plucking out both hair and beard. He is a stander up, rejecting the utilization of a seat. He is a crouching down on the heels, addicted to exerting himself when crouching down on his heels. He is a bed of thorns man, putting iron spikes or natural thorns under the skin on which he sleeps. He, is, he utilizes a plank bed. He sleeps on the bare ground. He sleeps always on one side. He is a dust and dirt wearer, smearing his body with oil. He stands where dust clouds blow and lets the dust adhere to his body. He lives and sleeps in the open air. Whatsoever seat is offered to him, that he accepts, without being offended at its being not dignified enough. He is a filth eater, addicted to the practice of feeding on the four kinds of filth, cow dung, cow's urine, ashes, and clay. He is a non-drinker, addicted to the practice of never drinking cold water, lest he should injure the souls in it. He is an evening third man, addicted to the practice of going down into water thrice a day to wash away his sins. If a man, Okasapa, should go naked and be of loose habits and lick his hands clean with his tongue and do all and be all those other things you have you gave in detail, down to his being addicted to the practice of taking food according to rule at regular intervals up to even half a month. If he does all this and the state of blissful attainment in conduct, in heart, in intellect have not been practiced by him, realized by him, then is he distant from samanaship, distant from bhamanaship. But from the time, Okasapa, when a bhikshu has cultivated the heart of love that knows no anger, that knows no ill will, from the time when, by the destruction of the deadly intoxications, the lust of the flesh, the lust after future life, and the defilements of delusion and ignorance, he dwells in that emancipation of heart, that emancipation of mind that is free from those intoxications, and that he, whilst yet in this visible world, has come to realize and know from that time, Okasapa, 
is it that the bhikshu is called a samana, is called a brahmana? And if a man, Okasapa, feed on pot herbs, on wild rice, on navara seeds, or any of those other things you gave in detail, down to fruits that have fallen of themselves, and the state of blissful attainment in conduct, in heart, and intellect have not been practiced by him, realized by him, then he is then is he distant from samanaship, distant from bhamanaship. But from the time, Okasapa, when a bhikshu has cultivated the heart of love that knows no anger, that knows no ill will, from the time when, by the destruction of the deadly intoxications, the lust of the flesh, the lust after future life, and the defilement of delusion and ignorance. He dwells in that emancipation of heart, that emancipation of mind, that is free from those intoxications, and that he, whilst yet in this visible world, has come to realize and know, from that time, O Kasapa, is it that the bhikshu is called a samana, is called a brahmana. And if a man, O Kasapa, wear coarse hempen cloth, or carry out all or any of those other practices you gave in detail, down to bathing in water three times a day, and the state of blissful attainment in conduct, in heart, and in intellect have not been practiced by him, realized by him. Then is he distant from samanaship, distant from brahmanaship. But from the time, O Kosapa, when a bhikshu has cultivated the heart of love that knows no anger, that knows no ill will, from the time when, by the destruction of the deadly intoxications, the lust of the flesh, the lust after future life, and the defilements of delusion and ignorance, he dwells in that emancipation of heart, that emancipation of mind, that is free from the intoxications, and that he, whilst yet in this visible world, has come to realize and know. From that time, O Kasapa, is it that the bhikshu is called a samana, is called a brahmana. And when he had thus spoken, Kasapa the Nidika said to the blessed one, How hard then, O Gotama, must samana should be to gain? How hard must brahmana should be? That Kasapa is a saying, is a common saying in the world that the life of a samana and of a brahmana is hard to lead. But if the hardness, the very great hardness of that life depended merely on this asceticism, on the carrying out of any or all of those practices you gave, you have detailed, then it would not be fitting to say that the life of the Samana of the Brahmana was hard to lead. It would be quite possible for a householder or the son of a householder, for anyone down to the slave girl who carries the water jar to say, let me now go naked, let me become of low habits, and so on, through all the items of those three lists of yours. But since Kasapa, quite apart from these matters, quite apart from all kinds of penance, the life is hard, very hard to lead, Therefore is it that it is fitting to say, How hard must Samana should be to gain? How hard must Brahmana should be? For from the time, O Kasapa, when a bhikshu has cultivated the heart of love that knows no anger, that knows no ill will, from the time when by the destruction of the deadly intoxications, the lusts of the flesh, the lust after future life, and the defilements of delusion and ignorance, he dwells in that emancipation of heart, in that emancipation of mind that is free from those intoxications, and that he, whilst yet in this visible world, has come to realize and know. From that time, O Kasapa, is it that the bhikshu is called a samana, is called a brahmana. And when he had thus spoken, Kasapa the naked ascetic said to the blessed one, Hard is it, Gotama, to know when a man is a samana, hard is it to know when a man is a brahmana. That Kasapa is a common saying in the world, that it is hard to know a samana, hard to know a brahmana. But if being a samana, if by if being a brahmana, depending merely on this asceticism, on the carrying out any in the carrying out of any or each of those practices you have detailed, then it would not be fitting to say that a samana is hard to recognize, a brahmana is hard to recognize. It would be quite possible for a householder or the son of a householder for, or for any one down to the slave girl who carries the water jar to know this man goes naked or is of loose habits or licks his fingers with his tongue and so on through all the items of those, those three lists of yours. But since Kasapa, quite apart from these matters, quite apart from all kinds of penance, it is hard to recognize a samana hard to recognize a brahmana. Therefore is it fitting to say, hard is it to know when a man is a samana, to know when a man is a brahmana. For from the time, Okasapa, when a bhikshu has cultivated the heart of love that knows no anger, that knows no ill will, from the time when, by the destruction of the deadly intoxications, the lusts of the flesh, the lust, of af the lust after future life, and the defilements of delusion and ignorance, he dwells in that emancipation of heart, in that emancipation of mind, that is free from those intoxications, and that he, whilst, whilst yet in this visible world, has come to know, to realize and know. From that time, Okasapa, is it that the bhikshu is called a samana, is called a brahmana? And when he had thus spoken, Kasapa the naked ascetic said to the blessed one, What then, Gotama, is that the blissful attainment in conduct, in heart and in mind? Here in Kasapa, a Tathagata arises in the world, a worthy one, perfectly enlightened, endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, accomplished, a newer of the world, unsurpassed trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of angels and men, enlightened and exalted. 
having realized by his own direct knowledge the world, this world with its angels, its Mars, and its Brahmas, this generation with its recluses and Brahmins, its rulers and people, he makes it known to others. He teaches the Dhamma that is benevolent in the beginning, benevolent in the middle, and benevolent in the end, possessing meaning and phrasing. He reveals the holy life that is fully complete and purified. A householder or a householder's son or one born into some other family hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he gains faith in the Tathagata. And Dao with such faith, he reflects. The household life is crowded, a path of dust. Going forth is like the open air. It is not easy for one dwelling at home to lead the perfectly complete, perfectly purified holy life, bright as a polished conch. Let me then shave off my hair and beard, put on saffron robes, and go forth from home to homelessness. After some time, he abandons his accumulation of wealth, be it large or small. He abandons his circle of relatives, be it large or small. He shaves off his hair and beard, puts on saffron robes, and goes forth from home to homelessness. When he has thus gone forth, he lives restrained by the restraint of the Patimoka, possessed of po proper behavior and resort. Having taken up the rules of training, he trains himself in them, seeing danger in the slightest faults. He comes to be endowed with wholesome bodily and verbal action. His livelihood is purified, and he is possessed of conduct. He guards the doors of his sense faculties, is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension, and is content. And how Kasapa is the bhikshu possessed of ethical discipline? Here in Kasapa, having abandoned the destruction of life, the bhikshu abstains from the destruction of life. He has laid down the rod and weapon and dwells conscientious, full of kindness, sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings. This Kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Having abandoned taking what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Accepting and expecting only what is given, he lives in honesty with a pure mind. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Having abandoned in celibacy, he leads the holy life of celibacy. He dwells aloof and abstains from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Having abandoned false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks only the truth. He lives devoted to truth, trustworthy and reliable. He does not deceive anyone in the world. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Having abandoned slander, he abstains from slander. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard in order to divide others from the people here, nor does he repeat here what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these from the people there. Thus he is a reconciler of those who are divided and a promoter of friendships. Rejoicing, delighting, and exulting in concord, he speaks only words that are conducive to concord. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Having abandoned harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks only such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, endearing, going to the heart, polite, amiable, and agreeable to the many folk. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Having abandoned idle chatter, he abstains from idle chatter. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is factual and beneficial, speaks on the Dharma and the discipline. His words are worth treasuring. They are timely, backed by reasons, measured and connected with the benevolent. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from damaging seed and plant life. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He eats only in one part of the day, refraining from food at night and from eating at improper times. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from dancing, singing, instrumental music, and from witnessing unsuitable shows. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from wearing garlands, embellishing himself with scents, and beautifying himself with unguents. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from high and luxurious beds and seats. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from accepting uncooked grain, raw meat, women and girls, male and female slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and swine, elephants, cattle, horses, and mares. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains, from, he abstains from accepting fields and lands. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from running messages and errands. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from buying and selling. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from dealing with false weights, false metals, and false measures. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from crooked, the crooked ways of bribery, deception, and fraud. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. He abstains from mutilating, executing, imprisoning, robbery, plunder, and violence. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. This too. This too pertains to his ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on food offered by the faithful, continually cause damage to seed and plant life, to plants propagated from root seeds, roots, stems, joints, buds, and seeds. He abstains from damaging seed and plant life. 
This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the utilization of stored-up treasures, such as stored-up food, drinks, garments, vehicles, bedding, scents, and comestibles. He abstains from the utilization of stored-up treasures. This kasapa pertains to his perfection and ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on food offered by the faithful, intend, attend unsuitable shows, such as shows featuring dancing, singing, or instrumental music, theatrical performances, narrations of legends, music played by hand clapping, cymbals, and drums, Picture houses, acrobatic performances, combats of elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, goats, rams, cocks, and quails, stick, fi stick fights, boxing and wrestling, sham fights, roll calls, battle arrays, and regimental reviews. He abstains from attending such unsuitable shows. This kasaba pertains to his perfection and ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmas, whilst living on food offered by the faithful, indulge in the following games and recreations. Atapada, a game played on an 8-row chessboard. Dasapada, a game played on a 10-row chessboard. Akasa, played by imagining a board in the air. Baraharapata, hopscotch, a diagram is drawn, drawn on the ground and one has to jump in the allowable spaces, avoiding the lines. Santika, spilikins, assembling the parts in a pile, removing and returning them without disturbing the pile. Kalika, dice games. Katika, hitting a short stick with a long stick. Salakahata, a game played by dipping the hand in paint or dye, striking the ground or a wall, and requiring the participants to show the figure of an elephant or a horse. Additionally, Aka, ball games. Pangatira, blowing through toy pipes made of leaves. Bankaka, plowing with miniature plows. Mokachika, turning somersaults. Chingulika, playing with paper windmills. Patalaka, playing with toy measures. Rataka, playing with toy chariots. Danuka, playing with toy bows. Akarika, guessing at letters written in the air or on one's back. Manasika, guessing others' thoughts. Yatavaja, games involving mimicry of deformities. He abstained from such games that are basis for negligence. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmas, whilst living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the utilization of high and luxurious beds and seats, such as spacious couches, thrones with animal figures carved on the supports, long haired coverlets, multicolored patchwork coverlets, white woolen coverlets, woolen coverlets embroidered with flowers, quilt stuffed with cotton, woolen coverlets embroidered with animal figures woolen coverlets with hair on both sides or on one side, bedspreads embroidered with gems, silk coverlets, dance hall carpets, elephants, elephant horse or, or chariot rugs, rugs of antelope skins, choice spreads made of kadali deer hides, spreads with red awnings overhead, couches with red cushions for head and feet. He obtains from the utilization of such high and luxurious beds and seats. This cassava pertains to his perfection and ethical discipline. Whereas some Akusas and Brahmas, whilst living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the utilization of such devices for embellishing and beautifying themselves as the following. Rubbing scented powders into the body, massaging with oils, bathing in perfumed water, kneading with the limbs, mirrors, ointments, garlands, scents, unguents, face powders, makeup, bracelets, headbands, decorated walking sticks, ornamented medicine tubes, rapier, soleil shades, embroidered, sands, embroidered sandals, turbans, diadems. Yaktail whisks and long fringed white robes. He abstains from the utilization of such devices for embellishment and beautification. This cassava pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in frivolous chatter, such as talk about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, talk about armies, dangers, and wars, talk about food, drink, garments, and lodgings, talk about garlands and scents, talk about relations, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, and countries, talk about women, and talk about heroes, street talk, and the talk and talk by the well, talk about those departed in days gone by, rambling chit-chat, speculations about the world and about the sea, talk about gain and loss, he abstains from such frivolous chatter. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in wrangling argumentation, saying to one another, you don't understand this doctrine and discipline, it is I who understand this doctrine and discipline. How can you understand this doctrine and discipline? You're practicing the wrong way, I'm practicing the right way. I'm being consistent, you're inconsistent. What should have been said first, you said last, and what should have been said last, you said first. What you took so what took you so long, what you took so long to think out has been confuted. Your doctrine has been refuted. You're defeated. Go try to save your doctrine or disentangle yourself now if you can. He abstains from such wrangling argumentation. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Where some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in running messages and errands for kings, ministers of state, katyas, Brahmins, and householders or youths who command them. Go here, go there, take this, bring that, from there. 
He abstains from utilizing such messages and errands. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while sleeping on the food offered by the faithful, engage in scheming, talking, hinting, belittling others, and pursuing gain with gain. <coughs> he abstains from such kinds of scheming and talking. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while sleeping on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of livelihood by such debased arts as prophesying long life, prosperity additionally, or the reverse from the marks of a person on a person's limbs, hands, feet additionally, divining by means of omens and signs, making auguries on the basis of thunderbolts and celestial portents, interpreting ominous dreams, telling fortunes from marks on the body, making auguries from the marks on cloth gnawed by mice, offering fire oblations, offering oblations from a ladle, offering oblations of husks, rice powder, rice grains, ghee, and oil to the angels, offering oblations from the mouth, offering blood sacrifices to the angels, making predictions based on the fingertips, determining whether the site for a proposed house or garden is propitious or not, making predictions for officers of state, laying demons in a cemetery, laying ghosts, knowledge of charms to be pronounced by one living in an earthen house, snake charming, the poison craft, scorpion craft, rat craft, bird craft, crow craft, foretelling the number of years that a man has to live, reciting charms to give p protection from arrows, reciting charms to understand the language of animals. He understand, he abstains from such wrong means of livelihood, from such debased arts. This kasava pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of livelihood by such debased arts as interpreting the significance of the color, shape, and other features of the following items to determine whether they portend fortune or misfortune for their owners. Gems, garments, staff, swords, spears, arrows, bows, other weapons, women, men, boys, girls, slaves, slave women, elephants, horses, buffaloes, cows, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, fowl, quails, lizards, earrings or house gables, tortoises, and other animals. He abstains from such wrong means of livelihood from such debased arts. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their, lively, their, their living by wrong means of livelihood by such debased arts as making predictions to the effect that the king will march forth, the king will return, our king will attack, and the enemy king will retreat, the enemy king will attack, and our king will retreat, our king will triumph, and the enemy king will be defeated, the enemy king will triumph, and our king will be defeated, Thus there will be victory for one and defeat for the other. He abstains from such wrong means of livelihood, from such base arts. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of livelihood by such base arts as predicting. There will be an eclipse of the moon, an eclipse of the soleil, an eclipse of, the, of a constellation. The soleil and the moon will go on their proper, proper courses. There will be an aberration of the soleil and the moon. The constellations will go on their proper courses. There will be an aberration of a constellation. There will be a fall of meteors. There will be a sky blaze. There will be an earthquake. There will be an earth roar. There will be a rising and setting, a darkening and brightening of the moon, soleil, and, con and constellations. Such will be the result of the moon's eclipse, such the result of the soleil's eclipse, and so on down to such will be the result of the rising and setting, darkening and brightening of the moon, soleil, and constellations. He abstains from such wrong means of livelihood, from such debased arts. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. <coughs> Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while sleeping on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of livelihood by such debased arts as predicting. There will be abundant rain, there will be a drought, there will be a benevolent harvest, there will be a famine, there will be security, there will be danger, there will be sickness, there will be health. Where they earn their living by accounting, computation, calculation, the composing of poetry, and speculations about the world. He abstains from such wrong means of livelihood and from such debased arts. This kasapa pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of livelihood by such debased arts as arranging auspicious dates for marriages, both those in which the bride is brought home and those in which the, she is sent out, arranging auspicious dates for betrothals and divorces, arranging auspicious dates for the accumulation or expenditure of money, reciting charms to make people lucky or unlucky, rejuvenating the fetuses of abortive women, reciting spells to bind a man's tongue, to paralyze his jaws, to make him loose lose control over his hands, or to bring on deafness, obtaining auricular answers to questions by means of a mirror or girl or angel, worshipping the soleil, worshipping Mahabrahma, bringing forth flames from the mouth, invoking the angel of luck. He abstains from such wrong means of livelihood, from such debased arts. This kasaba pertains to his perfection in ethical discipline, where some recluses and Brahmins, whilst living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of livelihood by such debased arts as promising gifts to deities in return for favors, fulfilling such promises, 
Demonology, reciting spells after in entering an earthen house, inducing virility and impotence, preparing and consecrating sites for a house, giving ceremonial mouthwashes and ceremonial bathing, offering sacrificial fires, administering emeticus, purgative, purgatives, expectorants, and phlegmagogues, administering medicines through the ear and through the nose, administering ointments and counter ointments, practicing fine surgery on the eyes and ears, practicing general surgery on the body, practicing as a child's children's doctor. He abstains from such, such wrong means of livelihood or from such debased arts. This kasapa pertains to his perfection and ethical discipline. Kasapa. The bhikshu who is thus possessed of ethical discipline sees no danger anywhere in regard to his restraint of, by ethical discipline. Just as a head-anointed noble warrior who has defeated his enemy sees no danger anywhere from his enemies, so the bhikshu who is thus possessed of ethical discipline sees no danger anywhere in regard to his restraint by ethical discipline. And now with this noble aggregate of ethical discipline, he experiences within himself a blameless happiness. In this way, Kasapa the Bhikshu is possessed of ethical discipline. This Kasapa is the, that perfection in ethical discipline. And how Kasapa does the Bhikshu guard the doors of his sense faculties? Herein, Kasapa, having seen a form with the eye, the Bhikshu does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the eye, evil and wholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the eye, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the eye. Having heard a sound with the ear, the bhikshu does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the ear, evil and unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the ear, and achieves res restraint over the faculty of the ear. Having smelled an odor with the nose, the bhikshu does not grasp at the sign or the details. If he were, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the nose, evil and wholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the nose, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the nose. Having tasted a flavor with the tongue, the bhikshu does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the tongue, evil and wholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the tongue, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the tongue. Having touched a tangible object with the body, the bhikshu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the body, evil and wholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the body, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the body. Having cognized a mind with the mind, the bhikshu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the mind, evil and wholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the mind, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the mind. Endowed with this noble restraint of the sense faculties, he experiences within himself an unblemished happiness. In this way, Kasapa the Bhikshu guards the doors of sense, the sense faculties. And how, O Kasapa, o how Kasapa is the Bhikshu endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension? Here in Kasapa, in going forward and returning, the Bhikshu acts with clear comprehension. In looking ahead and looking aside, he acts with clear comprehension. In bending and stretching the limbs, he acts with clear comprehension. In wearing his robes and cloak, and utilizing his alms bowl, he acts with clear comprehension. In eating, drinking, chewing, and tasting, he acts with clear comprehension. In defecating and urinating, he acts with clear comprehension. In going, standing, sitting, lying down, waking up, speaking, and remaining silent, he acts with clear comprehension. In this way, Kasapa, the bhikshu, is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension. And how Kasapa is the bhikshu content? Here in Kasapa, the bhikshu is content with robes to protect his body and alms food to sustain his belly. Wherever he goes, he sets out taking only his requisites along with him. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. In the same way, a bhikshu is content with robes to, to protect his body and alms food to sustain his belly. Wherever he goes, he sets out taking only his requisites along with him. In this way, Kasapa, the bhikshu is content. And now with this noble aggregate of ethical discipline, this no noble restraint over the sense faculties, this noble mindfulness and clear comprehension, and this noble contentment, he resorts to a secluded dwelling, a forest, the foot of a, a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a cremation ground, a jungle grove, the open air, a heap of straw. After returning from his alms round, following his meals, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds his body erect, and sets up mindfulness before him. Having abandoned covetousness for the world, he dwells with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Having abandoned ill will and hatred, he dwells with a benevolent mind sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Having abandoned dullness and drowsiness, he dwells perceiving light, mindful and clearly comprehending. He purifies his mind from dullness and drowsiness. Having abandoned restlessness and worry, he dwells at ease within himself with a peaceful mind. He, pu he purifies his mind from restlessness and worry. 
Having abandoned doubt, he dwells as one who has passed beyond doubt. Unperplexed about wholesome states, he purifies his mind from doubt. Kasapa, suppose a man were to take a loan and apply it to his business, and his business were to succeed, so that he could pay back his debt, his old debts and would have enough money left over to maintain a wife. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Kasapa, suppose a man were to become sick, afflicted, gravely ill, so that he could not enjoy his food, and his strength would decline. After some time, he would recover from that illness and would enjoy his food and regain his bodily strength. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Kasapa, suppose a man were, to, were locked up in a prison. After some time, he would be released from prison, safe and secure, with no loss of his possessions. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Kasapa, suppose a man were a slave without independence, subservient to others, unable to go where he wants. After some time, he would be released from slavery and gain his independence. He would no longer be subservient to others, but a free man able to go where he wants. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Kasapa, suppose a man with wealth and possessions were traveling along a desert road where food was scarce and dangers were many. After some time, he would cross over the desert and arrive safely at a village which is safe and free from danger. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. In the same way, Kasapa, when a bhikshu sees that these five hindrances are unabandoned within himself, he regards that as a debt, as a sickness, as confinement in prison, as slavery, as a desert road. But when he sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within himself, he regards that as freedom from debt, as benevolent health, as release from prison, as freedom from slavery, as a place of safety. When he sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within himself, gladness arises. When he is glad, rapture arises. When his mind is filled with rapture, his body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in body, he experiences happiness. Being happy, his mind becomes concentrated. Quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought and filled with ra the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. Further, Kasapa, with the subsiding of applied and sustained thought, the bhikshu enters and dwells in the second jhana, which is accompanied by internal confidence and unification of mind, is without applied and sustained thought, and is filled with the rapture and happiness born of concentration. This too pertains to his perfection in mind. Further, Kasapa, with the fading away of rapture, the bhikshu dwells in equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness with the body. Thus he enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, he dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. This too pertains to his perfection in mind. Further, Kasapa, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and grief, the bhikshu enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful, and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. This too pertains to his perfection in mind. This kasapa is his perfection in mind. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge, to knowledge and vision. He understands thus: This is my body, having material form, composed of the four primary elements, originating from far and more, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. This pertains to his perfection in wisdom. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body he creates another body, having material form, mind-made, complete in all its parts, not lacking any faculties. This too pertains to his perfection in wisdom. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imper imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the modes of supernormal power. He exercises the various modes of supernormal power. Having been one, he becomes many, and having been many, he becomes one. He appears and vanishes. He goes unimpeded through walls, ramparts, and mountains as if through space. He dives in and out of the earth as if it were water. He walks on water without sinking as if it were earth. Sitting cross-legged, he travels through space like a winged bird. With his hand, he touches and strokes the soleil and the moon, so mighty and powerful. He exercises mastery over the body as much as the Brahma world, as distant as the Brahma world. This, too, pertains to his perfection and wisdom. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the divine ear element. With the divine ear element, which is purified and surpasses the human, he hears both kinds of sound, the divine and the human those which are distant and those which are near. This too pertains to his perfection and wisdom.
when his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. He directs and inclines it to the knowledge of encompassing the minds of others. He understands the minds of other beings and persons, having encompassed them with his own mind. He understands the mind with lust as a mind with lust, and a mind without lust as a mind without lust. He understands the mind with hatred as a mind with hatred, and a mind without hatred as a mind without hatred. He understands a mind with delusion as a mind with delusion, and a mind without delusion as a mind without delusion. He understands a contracted mind as a contracted mind, and a distracted mind as a distracted mind. He understands an exalted mind as an exalted mind, and an unexalted mind as an unexalted mind. He understands a surpassable mind as a surpassable mind, and an unsurpassable mind as an unsurpassable mind. He understands a concentrated mind as a concentrated mind, and an unconcentrated mind as an unconcentrated mind. He understands a liberated mind as a liberated mind, and an unliberated mind as an unliberated mind. This too pertains to his perfection and wisdom. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of recollecting past lives. He recollects his, numer he recollects his numerous past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, or five births, 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 births, 100 births, 1,000 births, 100,000 births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion, recollecting. There I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an experience, excuse me, had such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my span of life, passing away from that state, I re-arose there. There too I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my span of life. Passing away from that state, I re-arose here. Thus he recollects his numerous past lives in their modes and their details. This too pertains to his perfection and wisdom. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings fare according to their karma thus. These beings who were endowed with bad conduct of body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, held wrong views and undertook actions governed by wrong views, with the breakup of the body after death, have reappeared in the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the lower realms, in hell. But these beings who were endowed with benevolent conduct of body, speech, and mind, who did not revile the noble ones, held right views, and undertook actions governed by right views, with the breakup of the body after death, have reappeared in the benevolent destinations in the heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the humans, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings fare in accordance with their karma. This too pertains to his perfection and wisdom. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imper imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the destruction of the cankers. He understands as it truly is, this is suffering. He understands as it truly is, this is the origin of suffering. He understands as it truly is, this is the cessation of suffering. He understands as it truly is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. He understands as it truly is, these are the cankers. He understands as it truly is, this is the origin of the cankers. He understands as it truly is, this is the cessation of the cankers. He understands as it truly is, this is the way leading to the cessation of the cankers. Knowing and seeing thus, his mind is liberated from the canker of sensual desire, from the canker of existence, and from the canker of ignorance. When it is liberated, the knowledge arises, it is liberated. He understands and destroyed his birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is nothing further beyond this. This too pertains to his perfection and wisdom. This kasapa is his perfection and wisdom. And there is no other state of blissful attainment in conduct and heart and mind, which is kasapa higher and sweeter than this. Now, there are some recluses in Brahma's Kasapa who lay emphasis on conduct. They speak in various ways in honor of morbidity, fatality, and so much as regards the truly noble, the highly, the highest conduct, I am aware of no one who is equal to myself, much less superior, and it is I who have gone the furthest therein, that is, in the highest conduct of the path. There are some recluses in Brahma's Kasapa who lay emphasis on self-fatality, and scrupulous care of others. They speak in various ways in honor of self-torture and of austere scrupulousness, but in so much as regards the truly noblest, the highest sort of self-fatality and scrupulous regard for others, 
self-affliction, and scrupulous regard for others. I am aware of no one else who is equal to myself, much less superior. And it is I who have gone the furthest therein, that is, in the highest sort of scrupulous regard for others. There are some recluses in Brahmas Kasapa who lay emphasis on intelligence. They speak in various ways in honor of intelligence. But so much as regards the truly noblest, the highest intelligence, I am aware of no one else who is equal to myself, much less superior. And it is I who have gone the furthest therein, that is, in the highest wisdom of the path. There are some recluses in Brahmins Kasapa who lay emphasis on emancipation. They speak in various ways in honor of emancipation. But so much as regards the truly noblest, the highest emancipation, I am aware of no one else who is equal to myself, much less superior. It is I who have gone the furthest therein, that is, in the most complete emancipation of the path. Now it may well be, Kasapa, that the recluses of adverse schools may say, the Samana Gotama utters forth a lion's roar, but it is in solitude that he roars, not where men are assembled. Then should they be answered, say not so. The Samana Gotama utters his lion's roar, and that too in the assemblies where men congregate. And it may well be, Kasapa, that the recluses of adverse schools should thus in secession raise each other following objections. But it is not in full confidence that he roars, but men put no questions to him. But even when questioned, he cannot answer. But even when he answers, he gives no satisfaction by his exposition of the problem put. But men do not hold his opinion worthy to be listened to. But even when men listen to his word, they experience no conviction therefrom. But even when convinced, men give no outward sign of their faith. But even when they give such outward sign, they arrive not at the truth. But even when they arrive at the truth, they cannot carry it out. Then in each of the, in each such case, Kasaba, they should answer, be answered as before, until the answer runs, Say not so, for the Samana Gotama both utters forth his lion's roar, and that too in assemblies where men congregate, and in full confidence in the justice of his claim, and men put their questions to him on that, and on being questioned he expounds the problem put, and by his exposition thereof satisfies, satisfaction arises in their hearts, and they hold it worthy to listen to his word, and in listening to it they experience conviction, and being convinced they give outward signs thereof, and they penetrate even to the truth, and have grasped it, they are able to also to carry the truth out. I was staying once, Kasapa, at Rajagaha, on the hill called the Vulture's Peak, and there a follower of some mode of life of your, as yours by name Negroda asked me a question about the higher forms of austere scrupulousness of life, and having been thus questioned, I expounded the problem put, and when I had thus answered what he asked, he was well pleased as if with a great joy. And who, sir, on hearing the doctrine of the Exalted One, would not be well pleased, as if with a great joy. I also, who have now heard the doctrine of the Exalted One, am thus well pleased, even as with a great joy. Most excellent master. Most excellent master are the words of thy mouth. Most excellent. Just if a man were to set up that which has been thrown down, or were to reveal that which has been hidden away, or were to point out the road to him who has gone astray, or were to bring a lamp into the darkness so that those who have eyes could see external forms. Just even so, Master, has the truth been made known to me in many a figure by the Exalted One. And I, even I, betake myself as, a, as my guide to the Exalted One, and to the Dharma, and to the Sangha. I would fain, Master, renounce the world under the Exalted One. I would fain be admitted to his Sangha. Whosoever, Kasapa, having formerly been a member of another school, wishes to renounce the world and re receive initiation in this doctrine and discipline, he remains in probation for four months, and at the end of the four months, the brethren exalted in spirit give him initiation and receive him into the Sangha, raising him up into the state of a bhikshu. Nevertheless, I recognize in such cases the distinction there may be between individuals. Since, Master, the four months probation is the regular custom, I too then will remain on probation for that time. Then let the brethren exalted in spirit give me initiation and raise me up into the state of a bhikshu. So Kasapa the naked ascetic received initiation and, and was admitted to membership of the Sangha under the Exalted One. And from immediately after his initi initiation, the Venerable Kasapa remained alone and separate, earnest, zealous, and master of himself. And ere long he attained to that supreme goal for the sake of which clansmen go forth from the household life into the homeless state. Yea, that supreme goal did he by himself and, y and whilst yet in this visible world bring himself to the knowledge of and continue to realize and to see face to face. And he became sure that re rebirth was at an end for him, that the higher life had been fulfilled, that everything that should be done had been accomplished, and that after this present life there would be no beyond. And so the Venerable Kasapa became yet another amongst the Arahats. Gospels, Matthew, chapter 21, Abiyadidos.
As they approached Yerushalayim and came to Bethpage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the master has need of them. The master needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the two daughters Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and a colt, the fall, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the on the road, whilst others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of God. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Yerushalayim, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? they asked him. Yes, replied Jesus, have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, God, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Early in the matin, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus entered the temple courts, and whilst he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the far went to the older son and said to the, and said the same thing. He answered, I will, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his far wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the sovereignty of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He, he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some tillers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to, tell, to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them further than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never heard? Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. God has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the sovereignty of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to parts. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet.
Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The sovereignty of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some further servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. They, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned the city, their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited do not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet any you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the benevolent, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They said their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin utilized for paying their tax. They brought him a denarius. And he said, He asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moshe told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now there were seven brothers amongst us. The first one married and died, and, his, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and, and third brother, right down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Whilst the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking up by the Spirit, calls him Master? For he says, God said to my Master, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Master, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on no one dared to ask him any further questions. Quran Surah Hud number 11 Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Alif Lam Ra This is a book with verses basic or fundamental of established meaning further explained in detail from one who is wise and well acquainted with all things It te teacheth that ye should worship none but Allah say verily I am sent unto you from Allah to warn and to bring glad tidings to preach thus Seek ye the forgiveness of your Lord, and turn to Allah in repentance, that Allah may grant you enjoyment, benevolent and true, for a term appointed, and bestow Allah's abounding grace on all who abound in merit. But if ye turn away, then I fear for you the penalty of a great day. To Allah is your return, and Allah hath power over all things. Behold, they fold up their hearts, that they may lie hid from Allah. Ah, even when they cover themselves with their garments, Allah knoweth what they conceal and what they reveal. For Allah knoweth well the inmost secrets of the hearts. There is no moving creature on earth, but its sustenance dependeth on Allah. 
Allah knoweth the time and place of its defined, definite abode and its temporary deposit. All is in a clear record. Allah it is who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And Allah's throne was over the waters, that Allah might try you, which of you is best in conduct. But if thou were to say to them, ye shall indeed be raised up after death, the unbelievers would be sure to say, this is nothing but obvious sorcery. If we delay the penalty for them for a definite term, they are sure to say, what keeps it back? Ah, on the day it actually reaches them, nothing will turn it away from them, and they will be completely encircled by that which they used to mock at. If we give man a taste of mercy from ourselves, and then withdraw it from him, behold, he is in despair and falls into blasphemy. But if we give him a taste of our favors, and after adversity hath touched him, he is sure to say, All evil has departed from me. Behold, he falls into exaltation and pride. Not so do those who show patience and constancy and work righteousness. For them is forgiveness of sins and a great reward. Perchance thou mayest feel the inclination to give up a part of what is revealed unto thee, and thy heart feeleth straitened, lest they say, Why is not a treasure sent down unto him? Or why does not an angel come down with him? But thou art there only to warn. It is Allah that arrangeth all affairs. Or they may say, He forged it. Say, Bring ye then ten surahs forged, like unto it, and call to your aid whomsoever ye can, other than Allah, if ye speak the truth. If then they, your false deities, answer not your call, know ye that know ye that this revelation is sent down replete with the knowledge of Allah, and there and that there is no deity but Allah. Will ye even then submit to Islam? Those who desire the life of the present and its glitter, to them we shall pay the full pay the price of their deeds therein without diminution. Diminution. They are those for whom there is nothing in the hereafter but the fire. Vain are the designs that they frame therein, and of no effect, and the deeds that they do are the deeds that they do. Can they be like those who accept a clear sign from their Lord, and whom a witness from Allah doth teach, as did the book of Moshe before it, a guide and a mercy? They believe therein, but those are the sects that, that reject it. The fire will be their promised meeting place. Be not then in doubt thereon, for it is the truth from thy Lord, Yet many amongst them, many amongst men do not believe. Who doth further wrong than those who invent a lie against Allah? They will be turned back to the presence of their Lord, and the witnesses will say, These are the ones who lied against their Lord. Behold, the curse of Allah is on those who do wrong. Those who would hinder men from the path of Allah and would seek in it something crooked, these were they who denied the hereafter. They will in no wise frustrate Allah's design on earth, nor have they protectors besides Allah. Their penalty will be doubled. They lost the power to hear, and they did not see. They are the ones who have lost their own souls, and the fancies they invented have left them in the lurch. Without a doubt, these are the very ones who will lose most in the hereafter. But those who believe and work righteousness and humble themselves before their Lord, they will be companions of the gardens to dwell therein for aye. These two kinds of men may be compared to the blind and deaf, and those who can see and hear and what and hear well. Are they equal when compared? Will ye not then take heed? We sent Noah to his people with a clear message, with a clear mission. I have come to you with a clear warning, that ye serve none but Allah. Verily I do fear for you the penalty of a grievous day. But the chiefs of the unbelievers amongst his people said, We see in thee nothing but a man like ourselves, nor do we see in that any follow thee but the meanest amongst us, in judgment immature. Nor do we see in you all any merit above us. In fact, we think ye are liars." He said, O my people, see if it be that I have a clear sign from my Lord, and that Allah hath sent mercy unto me from Allah's own presence, but that the mercy hath been obscured from your sight. Shall we compel you to accept it when ye are averse to it? And O my people, I ask, you, I ask you for no wealth in return. My reward is from none but Allah. But I will not drive away in contempt those who believe, for verily they are to meet their Lord, and ye I see are the ignorant ones. And O my people... Who would help me against Allah if I drove them away? Will ye not then take heed? I tell you that I tell you not that with me are the treasures of Allah, nor do I know what is hidden, nor claim I to be an angel, nor yet do I say of those whom your eyes do despise that Allah will grant them all that is benevolent. Allah knoweth best what is in their souls. I should, if I did, indeed be a wrongdoer. They said, O Noah, thou hast disputed with us, and much hast thou prolonged the dispute with us. Now bring upon us what thou threaten us with, if thou speakest the truth. He said, Truly Allah will bring it on you if Allah wills, and then ye will not be able to frustrate it. Of no benefit will be my counsel to you, much as I desire to give you benevolent counsel, if it be that Allah will to lead you astray. Allah is your Lord, and to Allah will ye return. 
Or do they say he has forged it? Say, if I had forged it on me were my sin, and I am free of the sins of which ye are guilty. It was revealed to Noah, none of thy people will believe except those who have believed already. So grieve no longer over their evil deeds. But construct an ark under our eyes and our inspiration, and address me no further on behalf of those who are in sin, for they are about to be overwhelmed in the flood. Forthwith he starts constructing the ark. Every time the chiefs of his people has passed him, passed by him, they threw ridicule on him. He said, If ye ridicule us now, we in our turn can look down on you with ridicule likewise. But soon will ye know who it is on whom will descend a penalty that will, that will cover them with shame, on whom will be unloosed a penalty lasting. At length, behold, there came our command, and the fountains of the earth gushed forth. We said, Embark therein, of each kind too, male and female, and your family, except those against whom the word has already gone forth, and the believers. But only a few believed with him. So we said, Embark ye on the ark in the name of Allah, whether it be whether move or be at rest. For my Lord is, be sure, oft forgiving, most merciful. So the ark floated with them on the waves towering like mountains, and Noah called out to his son, who had separated himself from the rest, O my son, embark with us, and be not with the unbelievers. The son replied, I will betake myself to some mountain. It will save me from the water. Noah said, This day nothing can save from the command of Allah, any but those on whom Allah hath mercy. And the waves came between them, and the sun was amongst those overwhelmed in the flood. Then the word went forth, O earth, swallow up thy water, and O sky, withhold thy rain. And the water abated, and the matter was ended. The ark rested down Mount Yudi, and the word went forth, Away with those who do wrong. And Noah called upon his Lord and said, O my Lord, surely my son is of my family, and thy promise is true, and thou art the justice of judges. Allah said, O Noah, he is not of thy family, for his conduct is unrighteous, so ask me not, ask not of me that of which thou hast no knowledge. I give thee counsel, lest thou act like the ignorant. Noah said, O my Lord, I do seek refuge with thee, lest I ask thee for that of which I have no knowledge, and unless I, thou forgive me, and have mercy on me, I should indeed be lost. The word came, O Noah, come down from the ark with peace from us, and blessing on thee and on some of the peoples who will spring from those with thee. But there will be the other peoples to whom we shall grant their pleasures for a time, but in the end will a grievous penalty reach them from us. Such are some of the stories of the unseen, which we have revealed unto thee. Before this neither thou nor thy people knew them, so persevere patiently, for the end is for those who are righteous. To the odd people we said, Hud, one of their own brethren. He said, O my people, worship Allah. Ye have no other deity but Allah. Your other deities ye do nothing but invent. O my people, I ask of you no reward for this message. My reward is from none but Allah, who created me. Will ye not then understand? And O my people, I ask forgiveness of your Lord, and turn to Allah in repentance. Allah will send you the skies pouring abundant rain and add strength to your strength, so turn not back in sin. They said, O Hud, no clear sign thou that hast thou brought us, and we are not the ones to desert our deities on thy word, nor shall we believe in thee. We say nothing but that perhaps some of our deities may have seized thee with imbecility. He said, I call Allah to witness, and do ye bear witness, that I am free from the sin of ascribing to Allah other deities as partners. So scheme your worst against me, all of you, and give me no respite. I put my trust in Allah, my Lord and your Lord. There is not a moving creature, but Allah hath grasp of its forelock. Verily it is my Lord that is on a straight path. If ye turn away, I at least have conveyed the message with which I was sent to you. My Lord will make another people to succeed you, and you will not harm Allah in the least. For my Lord care for my Lord hath care and watch over all things. So we when our decrees issued we had saved Hud and those who believed with him by special grace from ourselves. We saved them from a severe penalty. Such were the odd people. They rejected the signs of their Lord and cherisher, despite, disobeyed Allah's apostles, and followed the command of every powerful, obstinate transgressor. And they were pursued by a curse in this life, and on the and on the day of judgment. Ah, behold, for the odd rejected their Lord and cherisher. Ah, behold, removed from sight were odd the people of Hud. To the Tamud people we sent Salih, one of their own brethren. He said, O my people, worship Allah. Ye have no other deity but Allah. It is Allah who hath produced you from the earth and settled you therein. Then ask forgiveness of Allah and turn to Allah in repentance, for my Lord is always near, ready to answer. They said, O Sali, thou hast been of us, a center of our hopes hitherto. Dost thou now forbid us to the worship of what our fathers worshipped? But we are truly in suspicious disquieting doubt as to that to which thou invitest us. 
He said, O my people, do ye see if I have a clear sign from my Lord and Allah hath sent mercy unto me from Allah? Who then can help me against Allah if I were to disobey Allah? What then would ye add to my portion but perdition? And O my people, this she-camel of Allah is a symbol to you. Leave her to feed on Allah's free earth and afflict no harm on her or a swift penalty will seize you. But they did hamstring her. So he said, Enjoy yourselves in your homes for three days. Then will be your ruin. Behold, there a promise not to be belied. When our decree issued, we saved Salih and those who believed with him, but by special grace from ourselves and from the ignominy of that day. For thy Lord, Allah, is the strong one and able to enforce Allah's will. The mighty blast overtook the wrongdoers and they lay prostrate in their homes before the Matan, as if they had never dwelt and flourished there. Ah, behold, for the Tamud rejected their Lord and cherisher. Ah, behold, removed from sight were the Tamud. There came our messengers to Abraham with glad tidings. They said, Peace. Salam. He said, He answered, Salam, and hastened to entertain them with a roasted calf. But when he saw their hands were, went not towards the meal, he felt some mistrust of them and conceived a fear of them. They said, Fear not, we have been sent against the people of Lot. And his wife was standing there, and she laughed. But we gave her glad tidings of Yitzhak, and after him of Yaakov. She said, Alas for me, shall I bear a child, seeing I am an old woman, and my husband here is an old man? That would indeed be a wonderful thing. They said, Dost thou wonder at Allah's decree, the grace of Allah, and Allah's blessings on you, O ye people of the house? For Allah is indeed worthy of all praise, full of all glory. When fear has passed from the mind of Abraham, and the glad tidings had reached him, he began to plead with us for Lot's people. For Abraham was, without doubt of forbearing of faults, compassionate and given to look to Allah. O Abraham, seek not this, the decree of thy Lord hath gone forth, for then there cometh a penalty that cannot be turned back. When our messengers came to Lot, he was grieved on their account and felt himself powerless to protect them. He said, This is a distressful day. And his people came rushing towards him, and they had been long in the habit of practicing abominations. He said, O my people, here are my daughters. They are pure for you if you marry. Now fear Allah, and cover me not with shame about my guests. Is there not amongst you a single right-minded man? They said, Well dost thou know we have no need of thy daughters. Indeed, thou knowest quite well what we want. He said, Would that I had power to suppress you, or that I could betake myself to some powerful support. The messenger said, O Lot, we are messengers from thy Lord. By no means shall they reach thee. Now travel with thy family whilst yet a part of the night remains, and let not any of you look back. But thy wife will remain behind. To her will happen what happens to the people. Matan is their time appointed, is not the Matan nigh. When our decree issued, we turned the cities upside down and rained down on them brimstones hard as baked clay, spread layer on layer, marked as from thy Lord, nor are they ever much from those who do wrong. To the Madian people we sent Shuaib, one of their own brethren. He said, O my people, worship Allah. You have no other deity but Allah, and give not short measure or weight. I see you in prosperity, but I fear for you the penalty of a day that will compass you all around. And O my people, give just measure and weight. No withhold from the people the things that are their due. Commit not evil in the land with intent to do mischief. That which is left you by Allah is best for you, if ye but believe. But I, I am not set over to keep watch. I'm not set over you to keep watch. They said, O Shuaib, does thy religion of prayer command thee that we leave off the worship which our fathers practice, or that we leave off doing what we like with our property? Truly thou art the one that forbeareth with faults and is right-minded. He said, O my people, see we see ye whether I have a clear sign from my Lord, and Allah hath given me sustenance, pure and benevolent, as from Allah. I wish not in opposition to you to do that which I forbid you to do. I only desire your betterment for the best of my power, to the best of my power, and my success in my task can only come from Allah. In Allah I trust, and unto Allah I look. And O my people, let not my descent from you cause you to sin, lest ye suffer a fate similar to that of the people of Noah, or of Hud, or of Salih. Nor are they nor are the people of Lot distant off, distant from you. But ask forgiveness of your Lord and turn to Allah in repentance, for my Lord is indeed full of mercy and loving kindness. They said, O Shuaib, much of what thou sayest we do not understand. In fact, amongst us we see that thou hast no strength. Were it not for thy family, we should certainly have stoned thee, for thou hast amongst us no great position. He said, O my people, is then my family of further consideration with you than Allah? For ye cast Allah away behind your backs with contempt, but verily my Lord encompasseth all, on all sides all that ye do. And O my people, do whatever ye can, I will do my part. Soon will ye know who it is on whose 
on whom descends the penalty of ignominy, and who is a liar. And what and wit and watch ye, for I too am watching with you. When our decree issued, we saved Shuaib and those who believed with him by special mercy from ourselves. But the mighty blast did seize the wrongdoers, and they lay prostrate in their homes by the Metan, as if they had never dwelt and flourished there. Ah, behold, how the Madian were removed from sight, as were removed the Tamud. And we said Moshe with our clear sign, with our clear signs, and an author authority manifest unto Pharaoh and his chiefs. But they followed the command of Pharaoh, and the command of Pharaoh was no right guide. He will go before his people on the day of judgment and lead them into the fire as cattle are led to water. But woeful indeed will be the place to which they are led. And they are followed by a curse in this life and on the day of judgment. And woeful is the gift which shall be given unto them. These are some of the stories of communities which we relate unto thee. Of them some are standing and some have been mowed down by the sickle, the sickle of time. It was not we that wronged them, they wronged their own souls. The deities other than Allah whom they invoked benefited them no whit when there issued the decree of thy Lord, nor did they add aught to their lot but perdition, such is the chastisement of thy Lord when Allah chastises communities in the midst of their wrong, grievous indeed and severe is Allah's chastisement. And that is a sign for those who fear the penalty of the hereafter. That is a day for which mankind will be gathered together, that will be a day of testimony. Nor shall we delay it but for a term appointed. The day arrives, the day it arrives, no soul shall speak except by Allah's leave. Of those gathered, some will be wretched, and some will be blessed. Those who are wretched shall be in fire. There will be no, there will be for them therein nothing but the heaving of sighs and sobs. They will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and the earth endure, except as thy Lord willeth, for thy Lord is the sure accomplisher of what Allah planeth. And those who are blessed shall be in the garden, and they will dwell therein for all the time that the heavens and the earth endure, except as thy Lord willeth, a gift without break. Be not then in doubt as to what these men worship. They worship nothing but what their fars worship before them. But verily we shall pay them back in full their portion without the least abatement. <clears throat> we certainly gave the book to Moshe, but differences arose therein. Had it not been that a word had gone forth from before from thy Lord, the matter would have been decided between them, but they are in suspicious doubt concerning it. And of a surety to all will your Lord pay back in full the recompense of their deeds, for Allah knoweth well all that they do. Therefore stand firm in the sight in the straight path, as thou art commanded, thou and thou and those with who and those with thee and those who with thee turn to unto Allah, and transgress not from the path nor for Allah seeth well all that ye do, and incline not to those who do wrong, or the fire will seize you, and ye have no protectors other than Allah, nor shall ye be helped. And establish regular prayers at the two ends of the day and at the approaches of the night. For those things that are benevolent remove those that are evil, be that the word of remembrance to those who remember their Lord. And be steadfast in patience, for verily Allah will not suffer the reward of the righteous to perish. Why were there not amongst the generations before you persons possessed of balanced, benevolent sense, prohibiting men from mischief in the earth, except a few amongst them whom we saved from harm? But the wrongdoers pursued the enjoyment of the benevolent things of life which were given them, and persisted in sin. Nor would thy Lord be the one to destroy communities for a single wrongdoing, if its members were likely to mend. If thy Lord had so will, Allah could have made mankind one people, but they will not cease to dispute except those on whom thy Lord hath bestowed Allah's mercy. And for this did Allah create them, and the word of thy Lord shall be fulfilled. I will fill hell with jinns and men altogether. All that we relate to thee of the stories of the apostles, with it we make firm thy heart. In them there cometh to thee the truth, as well as an exhortation and a message of remembrance to those who believe. Say to those who do not believe, Do, not, do whatever ye can, we shall do our part. And wait ye, we too shall wait. To Allah do belong the unseen secrets of the heavens and the earth, and to Allah goeth back every affair for decision, then worship Allah and put thy trust in Allah, and thy Lord is not unmindful of what that ye do. Dao Te Ching Chapters 61 a 66 the large country is like the lowest river, the converging point of the world, the receptive female of the world. The female always overcomes the male with serenity, utilizing serenity as the lower position. 
Thus, if the large country is lower than the small country, then it can take the small country. If the small country is lower than the large country, then it can be taken by the large country. Thus, one utilizes the lower position to take, the other utilizes the lower position to be taken. The large country only wishes to gather and protect the people. The small country only wishes to join and serve people, so that both obtain what they wish. The larger one should assume the lower position. The Tao is the wonder of all things, the treasure of the kind person, the protection of the unkind person. Admirable words can win the public's respect. Admirable actions can improve people. Those who are unkind, how can they be abandoned? Therefore, when crowning the emperor and installing the three ministers, although there is the offering of jade before four horses, none of it can compare to being seated in this Tao. Why did the ancients value this Tao so much? Is it not said that those who seek will find, and those with guilt will not be faulted? Therefore, it is the greatest value in the world. Act without action. Manage without meddling. Taste without tasting. Great, small, many, few. Respond to hatred with virtue. Plan difficult tasks through the simplest tasks. Achieve large tasks through the smallest tasks. The difficult tasks of the world must be handled through the simplest tasks. The large tasks of the world must be handled through the small tasks. Therefore, sages never attempt great deeds all through life. Thus, they can achieve greatness. One who makes promises lightly must deserve little trust. One who sees many easy tasks must encounter much difficulty. Therefore, sages regard things as difficult, so they never encounter difficulties all through life. When it is peaceful, it is easy to maintain. When it shows no signs, it is easy to plan. When it is fragile, it is easy to break. When it is small, it is easy to scatter. Act on it when it has not yet begun. Treat it when it has not, when it is not yet chaotic. A tree thick enough to embrace grows from the tiny sapling. A tower of nine levels starts from the, deep, from the dirt heap. A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. The one who meddles will fail, the one who grasps will lose. Therefore sages do not meddle and thus do not fail. They do not grasp and thus do not lose. People in handling affairs often come close to completion and fail. If they are careful in the end as the beginning, then they would have no failure. Therefore sages desire not to desire. They do not value treasures that are hard to acquire. They learn to unlearn, to redeem the fault of the people, to assist the nature of all things without daring to meddle. Those of ancient times who were adept at the Tao utilized it not to make people brighter, but to keep them simple. The difficulty in governing people is due to their excessive cleverness. Therefore, utilizing cleverness to govern the state is being a thief of the state. Not utilizing cleverness to govern the state is being a blessing of the state. Know that these two are both standards. Always knowing these standards is called mystic virtue. Mystic virtue, profound, distant reaching. It goes opposite to material things. Then it reaches great congruence. Rivers and oceans can be the kings of a hundred valleys because of their benevolence in staying low, so they can be the kings of a hundred valleys. Thus, if sages wish to be over people, they must speak humbly to them. If they wish to be in front of people, they must place themselves behind them. Thus, the sages are positioned above, but the people do not feel burdened. They are positioned in front, but the people do not feel harmed. Thus, the world is glad to push them forward without resentment. Because they do not contend, so the world cannot contend with them.
Namaste, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Zajin, Adios, Te Chakaris, Asamudwo, Te Ufred. One love, peace, 